Welcome to The Foundry, where leaders are forged daily. Each week we investigate themes of leadership, entrepreneurship, and mindset with some of the greatest minds in real estate. And now, the data scientist of real estate, George Roberts. Welcome back, entrepreneurs. If you're out there wondering about the impact the runaway printing presses will have on inflation, trade, economic growth, and the real economy, you're in the right place today because I have Chris Galizia with us to talk about not just his important topics, but also his exciting upcoming movie, The Money Game, which examines all these issues in a manner that not only entertains the general audience, but which also draws some remarkable conclusions that are sure to stick with the audience well into the future. Mr. Galizio has been at the forefront of the investment industry for nearly 30 years. For over a decade, he ran the Fidelity Large Capitalization Growth Assets, which grew from $20 million assets under management to over $7 billion during his tenure. After leaving Fidelity in 2017, he started a hedge fund. By January 2020, he had written a white paper entitled The $340 Trillion Problem, as it became even clearer that financial markets no longer made sense. So at this point, I'd like to ask you to pick up that story. But first things first, welcome to the show, Chris. Thanks for having me, George. This is so fun to be here. Um, it's an exciting time for me. I feel like what, what we're trying to do with Money Game is change global market thinking. We're trying to show that the market that by the Fed intervening in bond markets, they broke the ecosystem of capitalism. But we did it in a way that everyone will understand. Money Game is kind of like goodwill hunting meets Wolf of Wall Street. It's a drama rated R. Um, it's what we're trying to do is attract a very large audience to explain to them in very uh, common, simple language to show how the ecosystem of capitalism is now broken. Now the entire system is misallocating resources, which then slows the real economy, which is the elephant in the room um, in, in our in, in, in money game. Um, it's never mentioned, but it's our lead character. Right. I love that. And I love all of those ecological analogies. I just think that's fascinating. And one of the things that we could do, and there's so much we really could dive into, we've really had one of the most anemic recoveries, literally in history. And maybe you could help us understand what's behind that. I love that chart because what you're, what you're seeing is in, in, so in 2008, the Fed intervened in bond markets. And I just wanted to point out over that period, you can see that productivity grew 2.3%, which is the slowest recovery from, in, in history. My belief is, is because when the Fed intervened in bond markets, the system started to misallocate resources. Things got much worse. That chart you showed is actually pre-COVID. So then we know that the unemployment hit 33% directly after that. And now I just saw uh, recently, I think it was in uh, June of last year, that productivity hit a 75-year low. Why? Because we have two different economies now. We have the financial economy and the real economy that no longer work together. It's one of the central themes of Money Game that we're showing is that by the Fed intervening in bond markets, they broke the ecosystem. Now we're investing in things like Dogecoin and FTX and GameStop and AMC and Tesla and Amazon. The system now rewards companies that need financing. It no longer rewards companies that, that generate profit. We're living in a centrally planned economy. We make the point the money game is, it's driving interest rates down and stocks to infinite. All of finance is based on one simple formula, the value of $1 paid annually. And the way to figure out the, cal the calculation for that is one divided by interest rate. So if the interest rates are 10%, the value is $10. If the interest rate falls to 1%, it's $100. And then in the movie, Fresser's going to say, what happens when interest rates go negative? And the class is going to say, I don't know. And he's going to turn and he's going to say, all assets are worth infinite. My coffee's worth infinite. My desk is worth infinite. My chalkboard's worth infinite. Does that make sense? Of course, that doesn't make sense, but neither does in negative interest rates. Who would ever buy a bond with a negative yield from a country that's monetizing its debt? Yeah, absolutely. Jamie Dimon said, uh, not unless you force me to. Yeah, there's so many things on that list, like the meme stocks. You, you right. often mentioned your hometown deli. I mean, it's crazy. But when money was essentially free, it made sense for companies to borrow. And now we're kind of coming out of that phase. And, and money still is free. Right, because um, because interest because we, as as financial professionals we use real interest rates, right? So inflation's at eight percent and interest rates are three and a half. So you're negative five and a half percent. So uh, so think about this. <clears throat> um, so the biggest point we're making in money game is that when you remove risk from an ecosystem, the ecosystem changes. The way we explain that is what would happen if the if we remove the lions from the savanna? Well, the gazelle population would explode. 
passive investing. But then they'd be competing with scarce water resources and die off, to which we have the biggest quote in our entire movie, correct. And when the Fed intervened in bond markets, they broke the ecosystem of capitalism. So now what you're looking at is you're looking, notice that over 80% of the market is passive and quant. They don't use fundamentals. So in the movie, we're gonna, we're gonna, we have quotes left from the professor from Professor Gardner in the movie, quotes like it's a bunch of followers following followers, like a cat chasing its tail. We're referring to quants following passive. As a matter of fact, the opening scene we have a um a herd of gazelle. They have a lion surrounded. They attack the lion and they eat it. And it pops up money game, um, which then we move into the real world. Um, the point being that there are no active managers left in markets. Um, the markets are now just a cat chasing its tail. Pretty amazing. And I don't think that's a system that anybody would have expected we'd end up with. But lo and behold, here we are. Well, a lot of things going on in the system these days. I want to say it's been maybe decades that central banks have been divesting their gold, but I believe there are many that have held on to it. And what do you make of this? I think it's interesting to listen to people say there's not enough gold in the world to back money there is you just have to add a digit so not not 2000 but 20000 all of a sudden you can back everything it's interesting to watch that central banks um, continually buy gold um, they're buying gold because it's underpriced it's at, in my opinion it's one of the most underpriced um, assets on the entire board because it's manipulated it's like everything else is being manipulated you're not living in a centrally planned economy anymore there is no price discovery and you're seeing it from the money game right i mean why does it make sense that interest rates go negative so everything you're seeing today, nothing makes sense. It actually comes back to my opening quote from Money Game. The task is not to see what no one else sees, but to think what no one else has thought about that which everybody sees. Because we're all seeing that nothing makes sense. We're looking up going, I don't understand investing these days. Why would anyone pay $20 billion for, a, for GameStop? Why are people pouring money into FTX? What is Dogecoin? So we're all seeing it. As a matter of fact, I saw a skit from SNL. Uh, Pete Davidson, it was called What Still Works. And he's refer he's talking, he's got his gold chains on, he's making tons of money on GameStop, clearly doesn't know what he's doing, but he's making a fortune. But it's funny to see that even Saturday Night Live sees what's happening, but fa financial <laughs> professionals still believe markets are efficient. The professor will will raise the book in the in the um in the we, we only have two classroom scenes because uh because we 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 want to show the story rather than lecture. This is not a lecture, it's a it's an entertaining movie. But the professor is going to lift the book, the efficient market thesis, and he's going to laugh. And he's going to say, smart people thought the world was flat once too. Um, then he's going to say the most underused books in finance are history books. And he's going to talk about the great German inflation. Because we, we all know the end game of this whole thing is that they allow true price discovery. Interest rates have to go above inflation, right? 10%. But the Fed itself can't afford uh, 10% because it would bank bankrupt the entire system. So the professor in the movie is going to um, talk about the, uh, the great German inflation, and he's going to talk about Van Havenstein. And at some point, Van Havenstein faced a choice, print the money or trigger the revolution. And that's the situation we are today. And you're seeing it every day. Even Yellen is telling you, if we don't print more money, if we don't increase the debt ceiling, uh, we're going to default. There's an economist I listen to all the time. His name's Luke Groman from Forest Through the Trees. He's, I think he's the best economist. What he says is that uh, the bull case for bonds today is the Fed prints the money because the bear case is they default. If the Fed defaults, as Yellen's telling you, they, they will default if they can't print more money, then the dollar goes to zero. Right? They're never going to let that happen. So they're going to have to print the money. Yeah, sadly true. And I actually brought up a couple of charts. I think some of these are things you've shown in one form or another. But if you take a look at net interest as a percent of revenues, I mean, this is going to become unsustainable, like over 40% in the next 30 years actions, but this is the road we're on. And if you take a look at what's going on with uh, federal outlays, interest as a percent of GDP, you know, we've had really low interest, right? We've been allowed to finance this debt for a long time. But again, we're now in this touchy situation, which, as you said, you know, what, what are we going to do? I mean, we have too much debt. You can continue to print money. But then what happens to the value of the dollar? I, I love those charts because think about that. As debt increases, interest rates went doesn't down. make sense. If you're, if, you're, um, if you're a private citizen, the more debt you have, the higher the interest rate is, right? So what you're seeing is there's no price discovery. Um, and your projections are 30 years, 
What happens if, inter if there was true price discovery and interest rates actually went to 10%? So the, the federal debt is 31 trillion. That's $3.1 trillion in interest expense. So all of a sudden you're at 70% just from paying your interest, right? So you have 70% of, of your budget because your budget I believe is $4.5 trillion right now. So you'd be paying 3.1 in just interest alone. So how do you then pay for healthcare and social security and, and defense? You can't. So, so those projections, just <clears throat> that's only because they're keeping interest rates below the cost of capital. The Fed has to have negative rates. It's a match, matter of national security that the Fed can contains negative rates. And by the way, that's also why Russia is rejecting the system. That's why Saudi Arabia is rejecting the system because they know if they if they buy treasuries with a negative yield over time, if they store their money in negative yielding bonds over time, they go bankrupt. So it's a matter of national security that the U.S. Uh, pays negative rates. It's a matter of international national security that they don't. And so you have this massive battle going on. Um, and, um, and I think, I, I believe that we're sitting at the end of the system. What I say in a lot of my, my podcasts is that, um, that money game will timestamp the biggest currency transition in history away from the dollar. And it, what, I'm, what I'm referring to is away from the dollar as a global reserve currency. And what you're seeing is you're seeing central banks around the world switch from dollar as a global reserve currency to gold. You're seeing it every day. Right. And you know what? I want to hit that next. But before we do, uh, let's talk just a little bit more about Germany. You recently on social media released a chart where you show that if you take a look at stocks during the Weimar Republic, they go up when denominated in Daymarks. This is not the first time we've seen this. We, this, is, um, this has happened a number of times. It reminds me of a quote from Phil Knight from, the, from Nike. And he says, everyone was looking for the next Michael Jordan on the basketball court, and he was walking up the fairway, talking about Tiger Woods. It's the same thing. Everyone's waiting for stocks to collapse because they are looking, saying, this doesn't make sense. But what's going to happen is the currency will fall. The Fed will, the Fed's, and so, so during a currency collapse, actually stocks go up. <clears throat> and you can see that from, uh, from Germany, 1921 to 1924. You can see it in Venezuela. So <clears throat> right now, stocks are trading in infinite. I think what will eventually happen is the currency will fall in real assets will go to infinite in dollar terms. And that's happened in every currency collapse in history is that the, the, uh, the stocks go up, not down. Now, it's different in this, this example because the U.S. is the global reserve currency. Stocks are already trading in infinite for companies that lose money. So if there's a currency shift away from the dollar, you're going to I, I, I don't I mean, what I'm what I'm owning is real assets. I own oil I own copper and gold, silver. I own uh, U.S. steel, things like that. I'm trying to own real assets. I'm trying to avoid companies, tech communications that don't make sense. Companies that lose money and that are that that need financing. It's most it's one of the most interesting times I've ever seen. All right. You said it first. You said currency collapse. So let's talk about the petrodollar. <clears throat> Give us a quick recap of the history of the petrodollar. And tell us about the demise of the petrodollar and what that might mean for the demise of the U.S. dollar. No worries. So, um, so, so I'll, I'll take you a little further back. Um, 1945 was Bretton Woods. Uh, the U.S. won the war. We were the biggest creditor in the world. We had all the gold. We made an agreement with the with the world that we would always sustain dollars for gold at thirty-five dollars an ounce. 1971 hit. Uh, right around 1968 to 71 hit, we had the Vietnam War, we had Johnson's Great Society, all these social programs. The U.S. defaulted on gold at that point and took themselves off the gold standard. By 1973, we went on the pet petrodollar system. We went to um, Saudi Arabia and said, you own a ton of oil. If someone wants your oil, they're going to roll their tanks in and take it. But we're the biggest military in the world. We can protect you. All we're asking for in return is that you take um, you take whatever profits you make from that you only sell oil in dollars, and you take the profits and you reinvest them in U.S. Treasuries, which then drove interest rates from in 1980 interest rates hit 18 percent under Volcker. Then it drove interest rates all the way down to negative or zero. Right? As the U.S. as the global reserve currency, you really can't go below zero because the big argument against gold is that it doesn't have a, have, a, uh, have a yield. So once you go negative, I think the central banks would switch to gold. So they, they drove it all the way down to zero, which is why I believe we're at the end of the dollar system um, because, we're, because interest rates are now zero and stocks are trading at infinite. The system has shifted from an investing system to a financing system. You're not investing in Tesla, you're financing it. 
think about it. If, you, if I gave you $100 billion, do you think you could, $100 billion a year, 10% of their shares, do you think you could take 3% of market share of, the, of, of, of cars? Of course you could. Anyone could, <laughs> right? So you're not, invest so in, in money game, the way we describe this, and we're trying to describe it in very simple things, simple terms. In March of 2020, interest rates were 0.66% in US. So the professor is going to turn to the class. And he's going to say, who here is willing to give me $152 if I give you $1 forever? It's one divided by 0.066. Um, and one of the students says, we'd all be dead by then. To which the professor says, correct. In other words, you're not getting your money back. But it's funny to see that a student in day one of class, of finance class, sees it, but financial professionals still believe markets are efficient. That's the irony. Right. And even after we've seen a pretty major shakeup, and I know Tesla has taken a major tumble recently, I checked just yesterday, we're recording at the end of January, and Tesla was at a price earnings of 45. And if I'm not mistaken, I want to say that GM and Ford were around six. So it's pretty stark contrast. And I think it's very interesting that they have the whole world. When, you, when, when everyone went to business school, they told you to focus on cash flow. They told you to ignore our earnings. If you look at Tesla on cash flow um, and you include stock-based comp, which is a real thing, because understand when you see PE mm -hmm. of, of 45, they've stripped out stock-based comp. So mm -hmm. If you add back stock, stock-based comps, which we all know is a cost to the investor, it's much higher. It's um, And by the way, Tesla, get, Tesla gets subsidies. So <laughs> I would argue that um, it's much higher um, than 45. Here's, here's what I actually think happened. I think the ecosystem changed. Okay, so I, I've made that point. So in a passive world, who makes the adjustment for dilution? So if Tesla issues 10% shares every year, in a passive world, who makes the adjustment? And the answer is nobody. It's a passive world. There are no, there's no, there's no analysts left, right? So when you issue shares, your market cap goes up because nobody makes the adjustment. If your market cap goes up, what does the trend fall in quant do? They buy it and they push it up further, mm -hmm. right? So, so what you're seeing is a market failure, which by the way, gets back to my, the, the closing quote in Money Game, if passive ever gets bigger than active, you'll have chaos and catastrophe, our markets will fail. What you're seeing is markets fail. Now, the opposite is also true. If you're a company like Petrobras, which pays a $7.50 dividend, stock's trading 11, by the way, but if you pay a massive dividend, who makes the adjustment at the X date? Nobody, right? So the stock becomes smaller in the index, then trend fall and quant sells it. So now you can buy that stock at 1.5 times free cash flow with a 70% dividend yield, right? So what you're seeing is you're seeing markets completely disconnected in fundamentals because nothing makes sense anymore. It's kind of an opposite world, right? Companies that earn money um, go down, companies that, um, that need financing go up. It's a centrally planned economy. By the way, it also comes back to another quote that we have in Money Game. Now the Fed's supposed to be like a, uh, referee in a football game. No one's supposed to notice them. But now they flipped the field 90 degrees and broke the scoreboard because it's not a level playing field. Think about it. If you're, if you're, um, if you're Tesla, you're getting $100 billion a year uh, to, to create new um, uh, plants and equipment. Whereas if you're Ford and GM, you don't. If you're a private company, you don't. Um, but the way we show that in Money Game is we have um, publicly traded companies like Shake Shack. They'll go into a, like a Shake Shack. Um, and it's, it's, uh, there's no one there because it's during COVID. Right. But the stock's going through the moon. Right. Whereas next door, you have a, a mom and pop, which closes because they're bankrupt uh, because they can't afford because they need to, they need cash to, to uh, fund their business. So what we're trying to show is we're trying to show an un unlevel uh, playing field. Um, and by the way, it's also um, I think the most one of the most important things is inequality. Right. When when Fed controls interest rates, money flows to the rich. All of them, and that's why we're seeing the most inequality in history is because money, stocks are trading in infinite. So if you're Amazon, you're trading in infinite. If you're Disney, you trade in infinite. Um, so all the money flows to the rich at the expense of the poor through inflation, because at the end of the day, we're, we're, the rest of us experience inflation.